Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Over the years, we've built a lot of tables. Dining room tables, bedside tables, coffee tables. We even once built a half round table with three legs that you slide up against the wall. Well, how about a table without legs? Or maybe more of a shelf? We call it a wall-hung console. Recently, we found a very nice version at a designer showcase house. We'll take you there next, and then we'll come back here and build our own version of that wall-hung console. Ah, here it is. This is what I wanted you to see, this wall-hung console that's in the first floor hall. It was designed by Paul Worthington. And what he did is he took some nice thick mahogany and built this shelf, which has a gentle curve along its front edge. And just below it, a nice rugged apron that also follows the curve. And then you see here in the middle one big bracket, and there are smaller ones on each end. And then they're connected together with this brace. And the whole assembly is bolted to the wall. Now, I'm not sure I would build ours out of mahogany, and maybe I would make it a little bit smaller. But in a narrow hallway, this is a very useful piece. Some good ideas here. Well, here's our version of the wall hung console. Now, when it came time to select the wood, I considered quite a few. Oak, cherry, perhaps even some reclaimed heart pine. But when I thought about where I was going to use this piece, it was going to end up in a room where all the other pieces that I've built are made of mahogany. So I went with the mahogany, a favorite of furniture makers because it's beautiful to work with and it's very stable. Now the length has been shortened to five feet. It's eight inches out on the ends, 14 inches in the middle, plenty of room for a nice lamp and some candlesticks. In the center is a big bracket, solid mahogany. From that comes a brace that comes up to these smaller brackets. And if you look at the end of the small bracket, you can see that I routed a groove, which gives a nice detail to the side of the bracket. The rails have a slight curve. They're laminated. And the rails are mortised into all the brackets. And if you look underneath, there's a heavy rail across the back through which I can put lag screws to secure it to the wall. And that's not going to go anywhere. So if you'd like to build your own version of the wall-hung console, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, here's the stock that I'm going to need to build another console table. A nice three-inch thick piece of mahogany for that center bracket. This was left over from the one that I used to make the prototype. A two-and-a-half-inch thick piece of stock for the small brackets. These boards are going to go behind the brackets against the wall. Several thin pieces, which I'll laminate into the curved rail. Here's a couple pieces of stock that I'm going to glue together for the top. The back rail made out of poplar, because we're not going to see it. And a board for those braces. First thing I want to do is joint the edges to get a nice tight joint on that glue up for the top. And for that, we'll go to the joiner. But before using any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. The glue I'm using is a dark wood glue. And I'm putting a nice, even coat on both pieces. No need for biscuits. There's plenty of surface area here. Bring them together, clamp them, and set it aside to dry. Now, there's something else I want to glue, and it's going to take some time to cure. Let's take another look at the prototype. The apron has a gentle curve. There's one piece here between these two brackets and another piece here, made up of three pieces of quarter-inch poplar and a quarter-inch piece of mahogany, laminated together. That's next. As you've seen many times before, when I build a project like this, I like to have a full-scale drawing. 
This represents the top, but it also has all the other details. Here's that curved apron running right along the front. The inside radius is 61 inches. If I were to build a form at 61 inches and clamp the pieces up to it, when the glue cures and I unclamp it, it wants to relax and spring back. It'll be too flat. So when I make the form, I make the radius a little bit tighter. Now here's my form. Two pieces of 5 8 inch plywood that I cut at the same time. Then I separated them, put these blocks in between, and now I have a form. Next comes the stock. Here's what I'm trying to get to. Some stock that's a quarter inch thick, about three and a half inches wide. The poplar started out as five quarter stock. I've set the rip fence at five sixteenths of an inch width. I want a little extra to run through the surface planer to smooth the pieces up. Because the saw will not cut three and a half inches high, I've set it just a little more than half the height of the piece of stock. The surface planer is the perfect tool to get the pieces down to quarter inch thickness. I'll just shave a little bit off of each side. Now here I'm applying the glue for the lamination and I want to make sure I get a nice even coat on both pieces where they join. Sort of a glue and wood sandwich you might say. All even. And I bring the pieces together, work them around a bit and set them in the jig. And I'm going to use a scrap piece because I don't want to mar the mahogany because we're going to see that edge. And first I'm going to clamp this end. Nice and tight. Okay. Now I have found that because these pieces want to slip by one another that the glue, the glue starts to cure fa fairly quickly. So if I separate the pieces to loosen up the glue for a second and then take another clamp Go to the other end and bring it in. The pieces will slip by each other and then I can apply the remaining clamps and get a real good lamination. Okay. Okay, that's one. Now there's enough room to glue up another piece of the apron on the other end of the form. There are three brackets that support the table. A small one on this end, a large one in the middle, and another small one. The design is not taken from a historical document. They are a product of my imagination. What I actually did is took some plywood and started to sketch out shapes that I thought would be appealing. In fact, if you look at this small pattern, you see that I drew three different arcs for this inside radius. And I chose this one because I thought it was the most graceful. I did the same thing for the large bracket. Here's my blank for the large bracket and I had to add a block to the front of it so that it would be wide enough. I'm going to align the top and the back edge, trace the outline and go to the bandsaw. Because this large bracket is a thick piece of stock, I would prefer to use a half inch wide bandsaw blade. But because I have some tight radius cuts here down at the bottom, I've selected a quarter inch blade. I don't want to have to switch blades halfway through the process just for that little cut. Now I'm going to leave the line and later I'll sweeten up the surface with my drum sander. The advantage of the oscillating spindle sander is that not only does the drum turn, but it goes up and down so it doesn't get clogged as much and it gives you a smoother finish. I'm going to start with my largest drum which is four inches. That'll take care of this large arc and most of this OG. Then I'm going to switch over to this one inch diameter drum to do the final detail down here and I will have to do a little work by hand and this time I will go to the line. Now I'm ready to route the detail in the small brackets and they have to be a mirror image so that the routed section will face the outside. If I don't pay attention to that, I'm going to have one of them routed on the inside, which means then I'd have to do both of them. I've laid them out one inch away from the edges. I've set up my router with a quarter inch round nose bit and set the fence so that I'm right at the center of the bit one inch away. I'll be able to do all the straight edges with the fence. All right, now I've removed my straight edge fence. 
and I've taken a piece of wood that I've rounded the end on, clamped it to the router base one inch from the high point to the center of the bit. With this against the edge of the block, I'll get a groove that follows the curve. A dead giveaway that I did this with a router are these rounded corners. Now if I sharpen them up by using some carving tools and some small files, no one will ever know that I used a router. Now for the mortises to receive the tenons from the apron. The large bracket will have a mortise on each side. The small brackets will have a mortise along the front edge. I've set up my router with a 3 8 inch spiral cutting bit. I've set the fence and the depth will be 3 quarters of an inch. Look under the prototype shelf here. The back rail goes from end to end. There's a notch in it to receive the center bracket, and I'll show you that later. On each end, there are tenons, for which I need mortises. I'll make those next. With the mortises complete, I'm ready to start working on rails. Here's a piece of poplar for that back rail. I've laid out the notch that I mentioned earlier to receive that center bracket. Set the saw three quarters of an inch above the table and I'm just going to nibble away the material. For the last couple of minutes I've been setting up to form the tenons on the end of that rail. I've set up a stop block so it'll have a one inch long tenon and the tenon is going to be favored towards the face of this piece. So I've raised the blade to an inch and an eighth and I'll nibble away the material. Here I've lowered the blade and now I'm going to nibble away the top edge of those tenons. Okay, let's see how we're doing here. Okay, that's good. The two small brackets fit. The big one slides into that notch I made earlier. We're making some good progress. Tomorrow, after those laminations have cured, I'll be able to take them out of the clamps and form the tenons on the ends that are going to fit into these mortises, and then we'll work on the brace system. We'll easily finish this project tomorrow. Oh, good morning. Let's see how we made out on those arced aprons that we glued up yesterday. All nice and solid and dry. And I can check it against my pattern to see how we made out with that arc. Now if I line up the two ends, right there and here, you can see that we're pretty close to that layout line that I have on my template. So it was just the right amount of bend. Now what I want to do is clean up the edges. First I'll run it through the joiner, then I'll rip the piece to width. The key to getting a nice square edge on this arced apron is to keep the face against the fence as I push it through. With one edge square and my fence set on the bandsaw, I can now rip it to width. Using my full scale template, I can now lay out the tenons on the apron. And here you can see the edge of one of the small brackets, and here's the tenon, and here's the rail. So what I'm going to do is take my apron that's glued up, lay it right over those lines, and first lay out the shoulders. So I could take a combination square, slide it right up to that line, and put a pencil mark. I'm going to do the same thing on the inside. Okay, now a little mark at the top here, one here, and I want to connect those dots. because That gives me the shoulder that's going to be parallel to the edge of the bracket, like that. And if I pull it away, you can see that that tenon is not square at all to the edges of the apron. It's square to the bracket, because I already made a mortise that's 90 degrees to the edge of the bracket. So now what I want to do is center my tenon layout. The tenon's three-eighths of an inch. So I'm going to come in three-eighths, three-eighths. Uh, three There's the width, centered. And I like to use my ruler as a square. So if I very carefully place it on that shoulder line, draw out that way, come over to this side, draw, whoops, draw out that way, 
and then measure the length, which is three quarters. I've now laid out the complete tenon. I have to do that on each end of the apron. Well, now for a ballet at the bandsaw. The first thing I want to do is make sure that the blade is absolutely square to the table, which it is. Now, the first cut I'll make to form those tenons will be the length. Now for the shoulder cut. And I'm going to leave the line. I can always tune it with hand tools later. Now I want to cut the top and bottom of each tenon with a handsaw. First make a cut in from the end, and then a cut from the edge. Now it's just a matter of fine-tuning the tenons with some hand tools. A chisel, a rabbiting plane, and thin out the tenon and clean up the shoulders. It'll take a little while. After about an hour of fussing with those tenons, I've got them all fit. I've tested every one and now I'm ready for some assembly. The first thing I want to do is attach the back rail to the center bracket with some glue and a few screws. Well, now I've applied glue to all the tenons and the mortises, and I'm going to slip the pieces together. And you'll note that I've used my full-size pattern as a guide to make sure all the pieces will end up in the exact correct position. Now a nice long clamp along the back. Okay, now a clamp from the center to the outer edge of the small bracket. Okay, another clamp from this side. Look again at our prototype. There are braces which visually connect the brackets. And behind each bracket there's a three-quarter inch board that sticks out a half inch on each side. The braces will meet that board. There's no mortise and tenon here. It's connected with pocket screws. Once again, I'll use a pattern to lay these out. And I've made them a little bit longer than what I need. Here's the piece that's going to go behind that center bracket, and I'm laying out the decorative cut from a pattern. I might as well take care of that now. Not much to this piece that goes behind the small bracket. A notch to fit around the back rail, a little glue, and a few brads will hold it in place. Now, I told you that I left the braces long. I've elevated the frame three quarters of an inch off of the table, set the brace exactly where I want it, between the brackets, and now I can get an accurate mark of where I want to cut it. The pockets for the screws that are going to hold this together are drilled using a jig that's clamped in place and a step drill. The large portion drills the slot for the screw head, the small one drills for the screw shank. Now I like to apply a little bit of glue where the pieces meet and I also like to take a piece of wood on the face side that I want to be flush and clamp it in place so that when I screw it together the piece of wood doesn't push by it stays flush. Now it's the screws that do the work. 
It has a pan head, which helps suck the pieces together, and a self-drilling tip. Now would be a good time to drill some pockets for the screws that are going to secure the top. But once again, I bring out my trusty template and trace the outline of the top on the blank. I'm going to cut it with my jigsaw, and I'm going to leave about an eighth of an inch outside of the line. Now I'm going to use the template as a jig. By using this pattern maker's bit, which has a large ball bearing on the top, which will ride against the plywood edge, I'll get a nice smooth cut all the way around our top. Now we'll just pocket screw it all together and then it's off to the paint shop. The finish for our mahogany console starts out as a red mahogany stain, an oil-based stain, which I spread on, let it set for a little bit, and wipe off the excess. Now the trick here is going to be to blend these two pieces on the top. One is lighter than the other. The stain will take care of some of that, but the glazing step and the filler that I'm going to use on the top should take care of the rest. Once all the steps are complete, the final thing to do will be to coat it with polyurethane. After that red mahogany stain dried, we applied a coat of shellac and then knocked that down with a little bit of steel wool. Now mahogany is a very porous wood, so I want a smooth finish on the top. So what I'm doing now is applying a filler. I'm brushing it across the grain so it'll go into those little pores. And I'm going to take this squeegee and make sure that all those pores are filled. I'm going to let it set for about five minutes or so, and then I'm going to take a piece of burlap and wipe off the excess, always going against the grain or across the grain. And now that it's had some time to set, I'm rubbing it off using a piece of burlap, again making sure to go across the grain so I don't pull the filler out of those little tiny holes. Now we'll let that set overnight and tomorrow we'll be ready for a coat of glaze. Well, I put on a coat of shellac and after that dried, knocked it back a little bit with some steel wool. Now I'm applying a dark mahogany gel stain. And basically it's wipe it on liberally and then wipe it off with a clean cloth, blending all the tone together. Now I don't want to let this dry too much. I want to just, and I don't want to remove all of it. I just want to gently wipe it, make sure I get a nice, even finish. And after that dries, we'll be ready for several coats of polyurethane. And here it is, with several coats of hard-wearing polyurethane. This will be a very useful piece in any room, but especially in a long, narrow hallway where space is at a premium. Now let me show you what we're going to build next time. It's called a corner chair. And these have been around in one form or another for more than 300 years. And I can tell you one thing, they're very comfortable. Ours is built out of cherry. It has three turned legs, curved arms and crest rail, and pierced splats, finished off with an upholstered seat. We'll give you all the secrets on how to build this chair next time, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. If you've enjoyed this New Yankee project, you may want to try some of the others. There are projects meant for the workshop, the garden, the kitchen, and many more. So whether you're a fan of shaker style, or colonial, arts and crafts, or Chippendale, there may be a norm project you'd like to build. Whether it's a clock or a gazebo, a picnic bench or a Windsor chair, a child's toy or a sailboat, visit the New Yankee website at www.newyankee.com for a complete listing.